And this needs to be shut down immediately because, and once again, those groups are back, those tents are back up. And this cannot go unanswered. It's very simple. And, you know, there's a continuum of protesters. There's a heinous anti-violent ones that spewing hatred, spewing death, if you will. And then there's the less malignant that say ceasefire. But even, even ceasefire doesn't have the word peace in it. Never do you hear the word peace because this side doesn't want peace. It wants a jihad. And this is not pro-Palestinian, this is anti-Israel, and anti-Israel is a misnomer because it's really anti-Jew. And, and lastly, I'll, I'll get to Joe Biden and the White House finally deciding to denounce this after they've danced uh, around the issue for, for months. Now, Joe Biden launched his candidacy off of the Charlottesville lie when Trump had, Donald Trump had actually, actually, or actually explicitly denounced the KKK and neo-Nazis, and Joe Biden lied about it, and it took him months for any sort of full-throated uh, denouncement of these people. Uh, so, you know, just shame on everyone in, involved in this. You people are disgusting. As you just saw, mainstream networks are all in lockstep when it comes to the student Columbia protesters calling on their university to divest from Israel. And CNN was not represented in that small compilation. But trust me, they're also part of this cacophony of mainstream news pundits trying to make you believe that these students are all demons and they're genocidal and they're terrible people. When in actuality, the people saying this about them, they're the ones who are the terrible people. Now, I know you're probably still scratching your head and wondering if you heard yourself correctly when that Fox News host compared those two students literally to neo-nazis who marched in charlottesville in 2017 but your ears were not deceiving you she actually did that she unironically compared these students to neo-nazis but guess who else did that take a guess you're right it's democratic senator john fetterman who wrote on twitter add some tiki torches and it's charlottesville for these jewish students yeah so that's where we're at if you oppose genocide you're the bad guy. You're indistinguishable from white supremacist neo-Nazis, according to uh, some politicians and some pundits. You know, if you see the news and you feel sick to your stomach about famine, mass murder, ethnic cleansing, not to mention hundreds of bodies found in a mass grave in Khan Yunus recently, that doesn't make you a normal person, according to these ghouls. It makes you the bad person. You're the one who's hateful. They're like flipping everything on its head. This false equivalence isn't just Orwellian, it is dangerous because Nazis support genocide, whereas these student protesters, they're the ones who are against genocide, unlike people like John Fetterman and that Fox News host. Now, ironically, many of the students that mainstream media are referring to as anti-Semitic Nazis are actually Jewish themselves, but nobody wants to talk about that. As Peter Beinart points out, when I speak on campus, I ask what percentage of the pro-Palestine protesters are Jewish. Usually Jews are overrepresented. Sometimes they're the largest identity group. Maybe folks calling for cracking down on protesters in the name of Jewish safety should consider their safety too. And that's a really important Important point because anti-Zionist Jewish protesters and other anti-war protesters in general have been arrested and suspended and even physically sprayed with chemicals as was the case at Columbia back in January. The point is the university needs to protect all students, but as we've come to expect, universities tend to make exceptions when it comes to anti-genocide pro-Palestinian protesters. They've been silenced, doxxed, harassed, but yet that's never condemned as vehemently as the protesters themselves. If they call for from the river to the sea, that's genocidal, and we're going to conde condemn that, according to mainstream media. But if they're sprayed with chemicals, mm, we'll look the other way because we don't like them. It's just so frustrating. Now, that's not to say that you can't find individual examples of protesters being anti-Semitic because you're always going to find outliers at every single protest, especially if they're this large. But a common trick that we see when it comes to propaganda is they find these examples of outliers and they use those anecdotes to generalize the entire movement and paint it in a bad light. This isn't unique to the pro-Palestinian protesters. The same happened with anti-Iraq war protesters. They were called pro-terrorist. The anti-Vietnam protesters were called anti-Vietnam War, I should say, protesters were called anti-American. Uh, all Black Lives Matter protesters were called violent, even though the overwhelming majority of protests that took place across the country were peaceful. And now we see anti-genocide protesters being called anti-Semitic. 
It's a propaganda tactic. It's not a new thing. Now, this article is what a lot of mainstream outlets are using to say that these protesters are making Jewish students feel unsafe. So this is from USA Today, and they're talking about a rabbi's call for Jewish students at Columbia to leave over safety concerns. And this has been widely cited by media to basically validate concerns expressed by some Jewish students about the protests and how they're making these Jewish students feel unsafe. Now, it has a lot of quotes in this article about people saying that there's hate speech against Jewish students, but not a lot of examples. And that's because if they actually give you these examples, then oftentimes you'll question, mm, is this actually hate speech? Like, I mean, from the river to the sea, Yes, that can be co-opted and used in a hateful way, but the students overwhelmingly use it to say liberation for Palestinians. It's not genocidal. It's anti-genocidal. But, I mean, the examples that they, they include in this particular article, it stems from two tweets from a sophomore at Columbia University named David Letterer. Now, he supports Israel and chose to antagonize who he referred to as the pro-Hamas mob at Columbia by holding American and Israeli flags with other students. Now, one of the Israeli flags was stolen and subsequently burned. And as you can see, this student held a sign calling the counter-protesters Al-Qasim's next targets. For those who don't know, Al-Qasim is part of Hamas's military brigade that helped carry out the October 7th attack. Now, there are other examples, but I'm just going to focus on on those and the tweets from David Letterer because those are the ones that seem to be the most widely cited as evidence that Jewish students aren't actually safe at this campus. Now, regardless if they were being antagonized or not, I don't think that anti-genocide protesters should have snatched the flag from those counter-protesters, even though I admit it is enraging to see someone proudly wave the flag of a government doing a genocide. Still, let them protest because... If you provoke, if you give in to them provoking you, you're giving them exactly what they want. Now, as for the girl holding up the sign that says uh, that those students were going to be Al Qasim's next targets, I think that that is indefensible. And when we see things like this, we should condemn it. In fact, if you asked a lot of the students, I'm sure that they would condemn it. And it's easy to condemn because that person is an idiot. She's basically calling for violence against those students when the point of being there is to condemn violence, right? Furthermore, she's just playing into the tropes about anti-genocide protesters being pro-Hamas. So that person isn't helping the cause. And whenever there are examples of this, like, I have no problem condemning it, right? With that being said, these counter-protesters weren't being targeted specifically because they're Jewish. They're being targeted because they're being antagonistic. And these kinds of things happen all the time at protests, right? And that's a really important distinction to make because a lot of anti-genocide protesters are Jewish themselves and they're protesting the actions of a government, not Jewish people in general. And so the article reports the burning of the Israeli flag, for example, as if that's a fact that that type of action is anti-Semitic. But I mean, stop and ask yourself this for a moment. If somebody were to burn the Saudi Arabian flag or the Iranian flag, would you view that as inherently Islamophobic? I mean, I would think that that person is making a statement against the governments, right? So why is burning the Israeli flag any different than that? The answer is it's not. It's protected political speech, not anti-Semitic hate speech. And like all governments, it is fine to criticize Israel. In fact, it's necessary to criticize Israel since they're literally doing a genocide as we speak. But when media and our government tries to conflate criticism with the Israeli government and criticism of the Jewish people, I don't blame Jewish students for not feeling safe when they're told that the anti-genocide protesters are actually protesting them. Because I would think that too if I didn't know any better and I didn't actually listen to what these students are saying. For example, this guy named William on Twitter tweeted the following, My wife is a brave Jew. We stood alone at Yale University today. She wore no mask and was proud. Notice the horde hiding behind their masks. Now, it's not at Columbia, but nonetheless, these protests have spread to campuses across the country because this is a very big international movement because, shockingly, a lot of people don't like genocide. But I want to play this video that he shared because I think it serves a really important point. And 
there it is, a banner right behind her that says, Jews for a free Palestine. So Jewish people were already there. It's not like they were unwelcome. And furthermore, nobody attacked her or heckled her for her melodramatic performative bullshit because they're not actually anti-Semitic. They're anti-genocide. There's a difference there. That's pretty important. Now, that's not to say that anti-Semitism isn't a threat because it absolutely is, and it's on the rise, and I think we all need to acknowledge that. And the problem is conflating pro-Palestinian protests with anti-Semitism downplays the severity of actual anti-Semitism, which is very much a real problem, which is why it's so dangerous to conflate criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. As Mehdi Hassan put it, the decision by this far-right government, referring to Israel and Netanyahu, to insist there is no difference between Israel Israel and Jews around the world to insist Judaism and Zionism are one and the same is not just dishonest, but so dangerous for Jews around the world and it undermines the struggle against anti-Semitism. And he's right. It's dangerous, it's wrong, and it's incredibly disingenuous because the media and politicians condemning anti-genocide protesters under the pretense of fighting anti-Semitism don't actually care about anti-Semitism because if they did, they wouldn't make this harmful false equivalence. Furthermore, the safety of all students is something that everyone should care about. But they don't care about the safety of these students who are being harassed right now. There's media, politicians, and powerful people all effectively inciting hate against these students because they're taking a stand against genocide. And these same people are talking about safety of students on campus. Let me show you what I mean by that. For example, ADL President Jonathan Greenblatt is calling for the National Guard to come in and violently shut down these protests. Maybe crack some skulls. I don't know what he expects here, but he wants them to go away. David Frum is demanding no student loan forgiveness for students protesting. I mean, as if most students benefit from Biden's loan forgiveness. I mean, what a, what a joke. Now, here's what an actual professor at Columbia University had to say about students that he's supposed to care about. You know, we talk about protecting the safety of students. Listen to what he has to say about these protesters that he clearly despises. This is an illegal encampment. This is an illegal, uh, unauthorized protest. They just chanted, globalize the Intifada. You can see that it says global uh, Gaza Solidarity Encampment. They are saying that, right? Gaza Solidarity Encampment. This is what the NYPD was supposed, supposed to disperse yesterday, uh, but they did not. So um, I know it's painful to say this. I know there's a fraught history in the United States uh, with, uh, with US colleges, but uh, it's time to bring in the National Guard because the NYPD is in over their head. Uh, obviously, the President Shafiq and the administration uh, are unwilling to do anything about this. So, uh, and again, this is not a Jewish problem. This is not an Israel problem. This is an American problem. They are cheering on the Houthis. They are cheering on the Hamas who are holding right now three U.S. citizens hostages. They are, che they are cheering on Hamas to deny U.S. citizens their inalienable rights for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is not okay. If you are an American, if you're a decent American that cares about life, that cares about liberty, that cares about the pursuit of happiness, then this should worry you. If you care about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you should definitely want the National Guard to violently bust up these protests and crack some skulls because freedom. Also, I love how the first comment to his video is saying, I agree, occupying land and refusing to leave should be illegal. Hilarious. It's just, it's like a sick joke, right? It's a sick joke. But the reason why all of mainstream media, senators, and even the president of the United States is so loud and forceful in their condemnation of these students is because the students aren't just protesting Israel, some foreign government. They're protesting our government, the United States government. And their protest is drawing a lot of attention to our government's actions, specifically their criminality. In fact, a lot of faculty members stood in solidarity with students at Columbia demanding that their university divest from Israel because they know that these students are right. And rather than listening to the media's villainization of these students, you know, media could do actual journalism and, I don't know, talk to the students themselves. At least that's what one pundit chose to do. He spoke with two of the students who were suspended. And as you're going to see, these aren't anti-Semitic hate mongers that the media told you to expect. In fact, they seem pretty reasonable. The university was saying that part of the reason why they took this action, certainly the president of the university, was because, as I said, it posed a clear and present danger uh, in the university, perhaps threatening other students. Talk to that charge. What was the encampment like? Do you... Um, 
see any validity that the encampment was threatening to other students, made other students feel uncomfortable? Um, no, I think that the encampment was honestly one of the beautiful um, forms of solidarity. Um, we would be singing songs. We had meals together. People prayed together. They held Shabbat yesterday. Um, and it's really just been a very community-centered space. Um, and also because of the fact that it is outside, it hadn't disrupted any classes um, and had really been a very isolated kind of moment where the zone in which we were actually protesting in is the demonstration zone that we are allowed to technically be able to protest in. And so the school had already placed this spot to be a place that is meant for this, these kind of actions and therefore shouldn't have be, be seen as disruptive. And, and to that point, um, Mayim, Columbia University has a long history of college uh, protests. Did you see yourself a continuation of that long history of protests um, or do you see yourself as uh, being a different form of protest, that one that broke from tradition or does it continue tradition? Uh, we situate ourselves in a long legacy of activism, specifically on Columbia's campus. In fact, in 1968, I believe over 700 Columbia students were arrested when protesting the Vietnam War. Um, and so when we set up this encampment, we also set up a sign that said Liberated Zone, um, which was a reference to right. previous protests. Um, uh, I remember the first day we held a teach-in with a professor about the history of the anti-apartheid uh, movement on campus uh, when, when South African apartheid was going on, and that's exactly what we were trying to do now when protesting our funding of Israeli apartheid and genocide in Gaza. They're the ones on the right side of history, just as their predecessors who protested the Vietnam War and apartheid are now widely believed to be on the right side of history. And this attempt to smear these student protesters, it's not going to work because the American people already see what's happening and they don't support it. But rather than adjusting policy, you know, our governments and media institutions are just choosing to double down on lying and gaslighting us. But it's not going to work. The propaganda has failed catastrophically so. And our government has taken a hit to their legitimacy, not just domestically, but internationally. But they're still doing what we don't want them to do. The House just voted to send another $26 billion in murder money to Israel. I mean, they have universal health care and we don't. So rather than taking that money and investing it into our own people, we're saying, here's more bombs, Israel. Have at it. Bomb more children. Do more mass graves in Khan Yunus. It's just genuinely despicable. Oh, also, the UN uh, just had a, a Security Council resolution for full Palestinian UN membership. And guess who vetoed that? Our government, right? So our reputation the government's reputation specifically is irreparably damaged both domestically and internationally. And now everything that they're doing is all an effort to make them seem not as bad, you know, but the very people trying to make these students into the villains, they're actually the real baddies. And no amount of gaslighting will convince us that opposition to genocide is immoral, but nice try.